Good morning. How are we doing? Went to the dermatologist three weeks ago. Got a big chunk of meat taken out of my shoulder. That's really not a way to start a sermon. <clears throat> Let me rewind. My name's Bob. It's good to be here. I'm a missionary, pastor, guy, legend, <laughs> old. <laughs> but this spoke to me. So I go in, and I think it's going to be no big deal. And when I go in there, I said, hey, why don't you take care of the other one, too? You know, two for one. I don't want to pay twice. She said, uh, I don't think you know what we're doing. That didn't sound good. <laughs> I said, well, what might you be doing? She takes her latex gloves, out nurses wear those gloves. It was a white glove, and she took a Sharpie, and she drew a state on there. It was either Washington or Oregon, but it was the size of my palm. And I went, oh my God, but she's a woman and I couldn't flinch. I said, oh, okay, go ahead, <laughs> you know. You don't even need a needle. You don't even, I don't need any Novocaine, no, I didn't. I went, oh my gosh. I texted my prayer team, pray, pray, man, they're taking flesh out of me right now. But this is what's interesting, and so and I had no clue how bad it was. And when she was done, I turned my shoulder to the mirror and there was 20 stitches. And then she, I said, can I see that what you took out? <laughs> I wish I never asked that. It was, like, <laughs> it, was, it was really, really bad. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's, here's the, the, the spiritual insight from this. So I got this big package on my shoulder, big, I mean, they did compression, this whole thing. And I come here, and I'm, I'm really concerned about getting hugged. And so I get here, and I realize... There's a lot of huggers here. I mean, there's a lot of huggers. So, you know, I mean, I was bobbing and weaving the whole service. And, I th and, and at one point, I had my Bible, and I was carrying it like this. Anyway, here's what hit me. It's interesting. You can be in a place that's full of love, people that love, but you don't want anybody to touch your wound. That's not too shabby. <laughs> and I, I thought, that's really interesting. So there are some of you in here, and you got mucho wundo. <laughs> that's my Spanish. Been working on it for a while. You got wounds. And the very cure for your wound is the Spirit of God in someone else. But you got to let them get close. And you got to trust God enough with your wound. That was just the thought I had. So we're talking about the kingdom. I love this series. This has been a great series. Because here's what I found. Years ago, I interviewed people. You know, just I'm cruising through the Christian life and churches and ministry and everything. I started seeing people, and I, I wanted to know if they could really be honest, how would they describe their Christian life, their walk with God? And so I did a couple of men's retreats. I asked men. I asked a lot of people. I, I don't know, hundreds of people that I asked that question. And I said, just in an unfiltered way, would you just share how you would describe in one word your walk with Jesus? Now, don't, don't tell me what you think I want to hear. Just, just be totally honest. The number one wor word was bored. The number one word. It wasn't even close. The number one word was boredom. When we talk about the kingdom, the kingdom is the direct confrontation to your boredom. Because I will tell you this, what I see in scripture, what I hear in messages, what I read in books about the kingdom, what I see everywhere in the world, there is no boredom in this kingdom. Now there's no condemnation, that's just a quick little assessment. A little biopsy. So I'm going to give you four words, and we may even get to all four of them. <laughs> but here's the four words that always come into play when you study kingdom, when you see scriptures, when you hear Jesus talk about the kingdom, there's four words. The first one is mystery. Everybody say mystery. Sean said we were asking and praying, why does God have us here? Short answer is, doesn't really matter. <laughs> we don't need to know. Why? Because that's mystery. 
The second word is life. Everybody say life. life. The kingdom is full of life. The third word is vision. Everybody say vision. vision. And the fourth word is multiplication. Multiplication. When you see Jesus and his teachings about the kingdom, those four words will always come into play. And you get to receive some of those four words today. So I'm going to talk to these four words that have stirred me for a few years. And there's three verses about the kingdom that I, I want to read. And these are, these are just gems. I love these. Mark chapter 4. In fact, Mark chapter 4, Jesus tells the same parable of seeds and sowers four different times. Four times in one chapter. And you know what he says? If you don't understand this parable, you don't understand any of the parables. So he repeats it four times. But here's the short one in here. And I love this. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Everybody say kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. This isn't what the church is like. This is what the kingdom of God is like. Now what's interesting, as you look through Jesus' teaching... He never defines the kingdom specifically. He always describes the kingdom, and he always illustrates the kingdom, but he doesn't define it specifically. It's so that we would continue to pursue and seek and investigate and let, let spiritual revelation come as to what that is. But he doesn't define it. That's why he says in the 13 kingdom parables, the kingdom of God is like. It's like this. It's like this. And he gives agricultural illustrations. He gives fishing illustrations. He gives two other illustrations, finances. But he says, this is what it's like. And so today, I'm, we're, I'm just going to share this kind of what the kingdom of God is like. It must be important because the kingdom of God is mentioned 95 times in the Gospels alone. I, personally, I think the kingdom of God is a missing message in the body of Christ, and it has been for a long time. If you don't understand the kingdom of God, I guarantee you'll gravitate towards religious activity. Now, religious activity doesn't have to be bad, but if it's not kingdom work, it may just be religious busyness. And that really won't bring life at all. Now, when you talk about, I mean, really, when you talk about the kingdom, you need to understand this. There is a king, right? There's a kingdom, there's a king. Who's the king? You should be very convinced of this. Who's the... Was it Paul? No, no. Let me ask you one more time. I'm going to be the good teacher who gives you the answer. The answer is Jesus. Most of the time it is. <clears throat> Who's the head of the kingdom of God? Jesus. So, when we talk about the kingdom of God... Jesus, the manifest presence of Jesus, is the kingdom of God. Where his presence goes, the kingdom goes. What are the implications of that? Do you or do you not have the spirit of God that lives in you? Yes or no? Yes. If you don't, you can. But 99.9 .9 of you said yes. So if the, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, the kingdom of God is in you or near you. When Jesus said the kingdom doesn't come with observation to the Pharisees, as though you could say, look, it's over there. Look, it's over here. No, I tell you the truth. It's in your midst. Okay, draw a circle around Jesus. Where he is, the kingdom is. Where he goes, the kingdom goes. And on some level, you and I, with the spirit of God and the kingdom, where we go potentially, what goes? That's, that, that's a life-changing message. That is the cure for spiritual boredom. Get a hold of this. It'll change. It'll wreck your life in a good way, and it will change your life. And this is what it's like. Kingdom of God is like a man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows though he does not know how. Love it. Thank you. That's it. That's it right there. Though he does not know how. 
all by itself. The soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, the fur, full corn, kernel, kernel. I saw corn, kernel, Colonel Sanders. It was all right there. I'm like, <laughs> full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. He plants the seed. He scatters the seed night and day. <laughs> And he does not know how. Fall in love with that. Fall in love with ministry or mystery. I, I mean, I used to think, I used to be a guy that wanted to figure everything out. How's God going to do this? And figure it out. In fact, you go to enough seminars, I want to be very careful here. Not too careful, but careful. I've been <laughs> to a lot of seminars, most of them are reduced to a formula. You will never reduce the kingdom of God to a formula. Sorry. But seminars make good money. Formulas sell. But let me tell you something in the kingdom, A plus B doesn't always equal C. One plus one doesn't whatever. <laughs> It's a mystery. I had a mentor years ago in Singapore tell me, this was so great. Over lunch, he looks me in the eye and he says, Bob, you need to celebrate the I don't knowness of God. <sighs> wow, blew me away. I don't have to figure anything out. I did, I resigned. I said, done, I resign. I don't, I don't, I, I know very little about how things work. Well, you preaching about your ignorance? Well, maybe. But I have a high, high, high level of God does, and he is going to work it out. And as all as he wants me to do is follow and trust and obey. That's it. I love it. My wife and I got invited up to the church we planted 32 years ago up in Seattle, Washington. God blessed it. It went, it grew off the charts. Great building. It's been going 32 years it's wonderful. They said, we want you to come up here. We, we built a new wing on the building, and we want you to be part of the dedication. Just between you and me, I'm not a ceremonial guy. I, I just, that, that whole thing, I said, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you know. But I was blown away when we got there because one of the things they were dedicating was, show this next picture, please, the hasty fireside room. I mean... So they dedicated this big room and put our name on it, the Hasty Fireside Room. And you know the best part about that was, usually to get your name on a building, you gotta be dead. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. You wait till the guy dies and, oh, we're gonna name this building after him. It's like, he, he don't care. I thought, I'm still alive. Stay alive to enjoy that room. And so when I got up and shared, I shared these verses right here. And I said, let me tell you the history of this church. It's a mystery. And you can't figure it out. You can't put your finger on how, how God blessed it. You can't package it. God did what he wanted to do. In fact, you know, we prayed. I prayed the same prayer, and the people that prayed with me, we prayed the same prayer every week for 14 years. Now, Jesus said, don't pray with vain repetitions. Don't assume repetition is vain. It can be, but repetition is good. Here's the prayer we prayed. You ready? Fasten your seatbelts. This is the prayer. Father, you've seen hundreds of cars drive by this church every week. If you think we could do a good job in ministering your love, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness to any of them, please lead them here. If they're broken, addicted, afflicted, and we can minister life and healing to them, lead them here. If we would screw it up, keep them away. In Jesus' name. 14 years. Didn't advertise, never advertised. 14 years. No slick presentations, no nothing. That prayer. And you know what? God brought in some really broken people. Man, they came in floods, addicts. Find needles in the parking lot. What the heck? I mean, messed up people. Then there was such an imbalance. 
the messed up people overwhelmed. I said, God, could you bring some healthy people here? Just a few, just a handful, just please. And we watched that just shift. But it was so great because we didn't know. And then I started thinking this when, when I shared up there. This is, this is what I said. The kingdom of God will work with you or in spite of you. <laughs> and I can tell you, I was the least qualified. And God worked in spite. And then I started looking at all the, the, the mistakes we made. I was just re, recalling all the mistakes. Because there was so much growth, we, we broke every building code. We had people from the city show up. We'd run and hide from them. <laughs> occupancy codes, uh, occupancy codes, out of control. Sardines stuffed in a, in, a, in a room. Just everybody was stuffed in there. Fire codes, that, that's a little more serious now. You see that red truck come into your parking lot? You hide, you hide from them. <laughs> but then one of the big wigs in the fire department's daughter got saved and we baptized her. We got a little more favor on that one. <laughs> we broke common sense codes. I'm, I'm gonna share this story. This, I'm, this will just, just tell you just how, whatever you wanna call it, incompetent, Ignorant, sure, chief of all sinners, throw it all in there. I had this bright idea one time, one Sunday. Our head usher was a retired Seattle cop, just a cranky old guy. I mean, he was cranky, George. And I got this bright idea, because we were talking about guns, and, and I said, he goes, yeah, I've con I confiscated a lot of guns over the years. I said, how many you got? I, said, I don't know, 12, 15 guns. I said, hey, why don't you come to children's church and do a talk on spiritual warfare and bring your guns. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Can you see the problem here? Yeah. I just think it's a, this is great, George. Guns, funny little gun. This is a pen gun, man. It's made out of a pen. You can actually you know, bring it, man. Lay them all out there on the tables and start talking. And yeah, I swear, I thought it was brilliant. I thought. <laughs> You can do ch children's church on a little felt board, and here's Noah, here's his little boat, or you can bring George and his guns in. If you're a kid, what do you want to look at? Noah's Ark on a felt board? No, oh, man. <laughs> look at some steel. <laughs> so I'm preaching, and I see all these mothers jumping out of their seats, rushing to the back. Once again, I have no clue what's going on. I thought, man, they all have to go to the bathroom at the same time? What is, what is going on? They run. They're running for the doors. And apparently they were freaked out that their little kids were with George and his guns. <laughs> My son was in that class. <laughs> and then he proceeds to tell me. He said, yeah, the worst part was he started go going down the, road, the story road. Yeah, man, we got this one guy, he committed suicide, blew his brains out, it was like spaghetti. <laughs> Can you see the problem here? <laughs> Here's my point. The kingdom of God is much bigger than your mistakes. Much bigger than your failures. And he's going <laughs> he's going to work in it. And I don't have to know how. Attendance went down a little that week, but you know what? It recovered. It recovered. <laughs> Let me tell you, the longer I live, the more in love I am with mystery. Amen. And the less affection I have for logic. Logic, we always want to do the logic thing. You know? The disciples, 5,000 people. It's hot. It's like, get them out of here. Just send them, send them to buy some food. That's logical, right? Totally logical. 5,000 people, they're hungry. Jesus has been preaching a long time. It's hot. Hey, time's up. Send them away. What does Jesus do? The illogical thing. He tells the people that say, send them away, and he says, no, you give them something to eat. Man, that would have been the longest holy pause in history. Imagine Jesus is eyeballing you. 
He said, I'll send him away. Go, you know, go look at it. Go, we can't, we've got nothing. Send him away. Sean, <laughs> you give him something to eat. Stared him down. Stared him down. And what are you going to say to that? Well, I still think logic says send him away. <laughs> no, you look at Jesus. He's looking at you. And the look is, you are going to do this. And you're going to be glad you did. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't be experiencing what the kingdom is going to look like in your life. And you need this experience right here. See, he didn't. He didn't use people to get ministry done. He used ministry to get people done. That's what the kingdom wants to do. Mystery. Fall in love with it. Acts 1. Verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself to them, gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. If somebody dead comes back to life and starts talking, you should probably pay attention to that. So Jesus gives proofs that he was alive. Do you think he still gives proofs? No brainer. He appeared to them on a period of over 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God. What did he speak about? What was Jesus' first message he ever preached, ever, after he dealt with the devil and the temptations? His first message is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's his first message. What's the first thing he talks about after he raises from the dead? The kingdom of God. Do you think it's important? I think it's very important. One occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. John baptized with water in a few days. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? That's the logic again. He's back. He's alive from the dead. Let's get things straightened out. What does Jesus say? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates. Why? Mystery. He doesn't want them to know. Get used to the fact there are some things he doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want you to figure out. He doesn't want you to understand. You just need to go with it. You just need to trust. So Father set them by his own authority. But, love the buts in the Bible, but... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. When they're hearing that, they have no clue as to the implications of those words. No clue. Because they didn't really know where the ends of the earth was. So when he says that, think about this. These words, time traveled 2,000 years, and you're sitting in here, and you believe this book right here. Because Jesus said those words and gave them the, the power to do it. Think they were bored? <laughs> They're not bored. They're empowered. A.W. Tozer said something very profound. He said, if, you, if, if God took the Holy Spirit out of the earth all at once, most Christians wouldn't know the difference. He said, I will give you power, dynamic power, and you will be my witnesses. One of the things concerns me is how polished the speaking has got in a lot of churches. They got the timing down. They got the right joke placed at the right time, the right illustration, the relevant scripture. They got uh, props. They got different things. And you know what I wonder? That's not to knock that. I mean, I don't want to listen to a bad speaker. Do you? No, I don't want to say, oh, that's good, but it's bad. No, I, no. But I'm just saying, at some point, I wonder how much prayer goes into the power to set people free than the presentation. Jesus said, I'll get, you, you will receive power. He didn't say you'll get great marketing ideas on how to push this idea through. <laughs> No, 
No, I should slow down a little bit. <laughs> Statistically, there are a high number of pastors that are burned out. Every denomination. <sighs> Jesus said, I will give you power. I've done it before, so I know what I'm talking about. You can do ministry with the Holy Spirit, or you can do it in your flesh. You can. The problem is doing it in your flesh will eat your lunch. Do it in the Spirit, you'll have longevity. And that's what Jesus said. You're going to receive power. You're going to go everywhere. You know what I, you know what I love about where I go, some of the places I go? Hard places. Low percentage Christians, Nepal, you know, two, three percent Christians, lot, mostly Hindus, Buddhists, and they're hostile. And there's a lot of persecution. And one of the things I do is I teach at a YWAM base. And before I teach the class, it's a week long class, three hours a day, they give me a bio of each student. And I've done three of these classes now, and I'm going back in August to do another one. And as I read the bio, 75% of all the bios have an incredibly encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit that saved them. No, I mean, I'm talking, my dad was dying on the living room floor. You guys have village, no doctors, no clinics, no nothing. Christians came, first witch doctors came, bad and worse, he just went from bad to worse. A Christian came, laid hands, Instantly, he was healed. Instantly. 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 So what happens? The whole family gets saved. Because you can't deny that kind of power. Dad's dying. Dad looks dead. Dad's almost dead. Dad's alive. In the name of Jesus. That's who I get to minister to. That, I mean, that, to me, is the funnest stuff. Number two, second word. We're not getting to this. Forget about it. Second word is life. The kingdom life Jesus invites us to is defined by God, lived on his terms and with his love and power. This should set you free from the pressure to create your own amazing life. Once again, creating your own amazing life sells good on the bookshelf. Every self-help huckster out there is making lots of money by getting you to create your own life and being the best version of yourself. And some of it's true. Here's the way I look at it. I'll just, I don't even know if this is true. I look at a lot of that self-help, hyper-motivation stuff as junk food. Tastes sweet. You need it once in a while. You don't need it. You want it once in a while, right? I mean, Dr. J, you like a little ice cream once in a while, right? Okay. All right. Every now and again. <laughs> but it's like junk food. Your life that you could create in your best study time and craft this life will never compare to the life that God wants to give you. And if you let him shape your life, it'll be a sign and a wonder. Life you create may be impressive. It may impress people, get a lot of likes. Sure, okay. Okay but it will never be life-sustaining, and you won't be able to give it away, really. You won't be able to transform souls. This life. Now, now think about this, you got think about this. Luke 12 says, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What? What? God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The life in the kingdom, the restoration that comes with the kingdom, the freedom, the love, the healing, the purpose, the meaning in life, the power, the joy, the resiliency. And he just gives a line there and just says, oh, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If you don't realize what the kingdom is, what are you settling for? A life of what? Getting ahead? American dream? 
No. I, if you ever hear the word American dream, just gag. You know, just go. The American dream. The American dream is an American nightmare. It's full of self. You'll choke on. Don't say that. Mm. Nope, being a good boy today. <laughs> and you know what he says? Interesting, there's a few times where he says about giving you the kingdom. One point, Jesus said, I confer on you a kingdom. The same kingdom that the Father conferred on me. What? Jesus just throwing around the kingdom. Have some. It's for you. I bestow, I delegate kingdom life to you. It's free. You don't even need a monthly subscription. You don't need the master class. You don't need the podcast. It's free. Free kingdom. Um, blows my mind. This, two of these places where it says Jesus gives the kingdom, he then spends a whole lot of time about why you shouldn't worry. Which is amazing. And at one point, Jesus has the audacity. Here's the danger of when you say, Jesus shaped my life. <laughs> Here's the danger. One point where he says, I'm going to give you the kingdom, okay? You get it, free of charge. You get the kingdom. Don't worry. All okay, right, that sounds good. And go sell everything you got and give it away. I want the kingdom. I like my stuff. When you talk about kingdom, you have to use the word immersion and displacement. Jesus said, you were baptized by John. Good. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Even better. Baptize means what? To immerse. When you and I are immersed into the kingdom of God, baptized, immersed into the spirit of God, when you put something in something, it has to displace something else. Right? You drop something in water, when it goes in slow motion, there's a displacement. Part of the responsibility of the church and people that get a little glimpse of the kingdom is that we displace. We literally displace people. I see it two places. Haiti, Nepal, two specific churches. One, the roots of the family was voodoo and witchcraft. Just out in the open, that's where they did sacrifices, that's where all kinds of hell took place. The guy died, son got saved, pastor came in, the family said, we want to give this land to the church, and we want a church there. So where darkness reigned, light reigns. But one has to go, and one went. See how that works? That, that's true. I mean, I don't have enough time, but that, that's true in, in, in your own soul. Mm -hmm. Kingdom comes in. Something's got to get displaced. What gets displaced? I don't know. Greed? Selfishness? Selfish ambition? Pride? Arrogance? Worry? So the problem is these things don't cohabitate. If they do, if you let kingdom and all that other stuff cohabitate, there's a double-mindedness in your soul. And James says a double-minded soul is unstable in all his ways. You will never be able to enjoy either. Displacement. 1 John 5, 12, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Pretty simple. Purpose, divine life, present tense, blessed active, whole, peaceful. John 10, 10, thief comes not except to kill, steal, destroy. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. When I was driving here today, this always happens, and I just don't like the way I'm wired sometimes, but I'm drive, driving here, and I got my coffee here, and I start getting, like, insights. Well, now i got to write it down. So now I'm steering with my knees, drinking my coffee, and writing, writing these things. Don't do that. I'm just saying, 
I'm always afraid. I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. So I get a little obsessive on the whole deal. So I was like, oh, 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 I got it right. But here's what, it, here's what hit me. This is what hit me. It hit me on how much, I'm just going to call it, free stuff God has given us. No, free. Do you guys like it when somebody gives you something? How many of you like a gift? Like, wow, well, how many? Wow, well, yeah, I like it. I found five bucks on the side of the road the other day. I was like, oh my God, is it real? I'm checking, like, is it? But here's, here, here's what hit me Jesus gave the Holy Spirit free, Jesus gave his life free, Jesus gives gifts free, just gifts, gifts. Jesus gives spiritual gifts free. Jesus gives calling and purpose free. Forgiveness free. Called you at this time, Acts chapter 17, it says he gives breath to all. You're breathing because he gave you free breath. You ever think about that? That kind of stuff blows my mind. It's like, what would it be like if God took my breath away? <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Seriously, he, he called you where you live. You live where you live because he said, I want you at this time, 2024, I want you to be right there. I need you right there. The kingdom wants you there right now. And so I was just overwhelmed with all the free stuff, free wisdom. Jesus has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Gave it all free. Well, how does that play out in kingdom life with us? To whom much is given. <laughs> oh, is that what it says? Thank you so much. Wow. To whom much is given, much is required. And Jesus says, if he says all these words that just mess with you. Freely... You have received. Oh, it's good. Your life. You know what your life is? Here's what your life is. Well, if you want to get morbid, you go back to Psalms. Man, even in his best state, <laughs> I always think about this, even if you're living your best life now, <laughs> Man in his best state is a vapor in God's sight. There he went. <laughs> Gone. That quick. Life. What do you do? How do you do this? You have to empty yourself. You take an inventory of everything that God's given you. And you become a dispensary. That's the right word, or is that always related to marijuana? <laughs> I don't know. Couldn't think of another word. So, what do you have? How many of you have peace? If you don't, don't raise your hand. You have peace. How many of you have some joy? How many of you have some purpose? How many of you have some energy? How many of you have some money? How many of you have some wisdom? Some. Keep your hands up. Just keep just keep them. How many of you know, literally, you have been saved by God? Whoa, okay. What is your life? Here's your life, ready? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You don't need a seminar, that's the seminar. I know we wanna to go to seminars. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, his rightness, his alignment. Literally, righteousness and justice are connected there. Literally means, like before the fall, things were righteous. They were right. There was shalom. There was peace. Sin came in, fractured that, disrupted it, complicated it. So when Jesus comes in righteousness, he takes care of the sin issue by a sacrifice. He makes it right. You and I are called to be ministers of reconciliation. We're called to make things right. What does that mean? I, it means so much. I just, you simply walk the earth and you look for what's not right. What's, what's not right? You see a family, you know, in crisis, 
That's not right. You bring peace. You see poor people living on dirt? That's not right. I wouldn't do it. Build a house for them. See people, they drink dirty water? You dig a well for them. You simply just go, what's not right? And God, how can I make it right? This is life. I mean, this, this really is it. We're not getting to the other two things. So if you thought that was going to happen, it's not going to. Some of you are worried. It's like, I'm watching the clock, and I'm just thinking, he's not going to do it. <laughs> it's okay. I'm relaxed. I get on a plane in two hours, and I fly to Austin, Texas, where I drive my son and his Prius that doesn't have air conditioning back to Sacramento. That's abundant life, kids. You have no idea. Just a, that's abundant life. It just drips with, uh, I'll be dripping with abundant life. Let me show you some pics. This is what we're involved in. Once again, the sooner you understand your life is meant to give away, you'll get it. You will have joy unspeakable, full of glory. Here's a couple pictures of what we're doing. Sean mentioned Haiti. That's not Haiti, that's Nepal, but that's good too. Uh, we're building a church. My nonprofit's building the fourth church in Nepal. This is up in the mountains. Just started, but no, don't go to Pakistan yet. Back up one. Okay. They started building this church. Two weeks ago, they baptized 30 new converts. That's life. That's life. I got to tell you something crazy. It goes back to mystery. Can't figure it out. I've only told this one, one place publicly. I'm going to tell you. I was teaching a mission seminar a month ago in Albania. I let it leak out. I'm going to let it leak out on you. It's scary, and I don't know how it's going to work. <clears throat> but I believe that God, that God has put in my heart to build 100 churches in Nepal before I die. So, going to need a lot of money, <laughs> and I'm going to need, like, a few years, okay? I need 20. I need 20 years. Now, you say, well, how many you got built in Nepal? Four. Four down, 96 to go. I know, I know, I know. How you gonna do I don't know. But you know what? It's going to get done in Jesus' name. And if it's night, if it's not, when I die, come to my funeral, eat potato salad, take a sucker, throw it in my grave. No problem. No, serious, do it. 100 churches. Sucker. Won't hurt me a bit. I'll be with Jesus think I'm joking. I'm not joking. Give me the next one. <laughs> you know, you can be afraid or you can be fearless. I've lived in fear. Forget it. I don't know how it's going to work out, but you'll keep hearing it. Up to 57. Go, man, go. Pakistan, we've built or rebuilt four churches. You know what's great about these countries? Five years ago, if you gave me a map, I couldn't have told you where they were. And then God sends me, whitest guy on the planet. I'm not even joking. I, mean, I go there like, wow, <laughs> I'm really different here. <laughs> but I've made it nine times. I've got out of Pakistan nine times. I go back in November for the 10th time. Your prayers would be appreciated. So this is one of the churches that we're building right now. Next thing. Here we go. We got Haiti now. Got Sean down in Haiti. He got all excited. <laughs> I showed him the, the yellow notepad ministry. He loved that. And he committed. He wasn't getting out of there without a commitment. <laughs> You're not leaving here, man. I know where we can leave you. So make a commitment. <laughs> so well, maybe a little duress. A little duress led by the Spirit. Maybe a little spiritual manipulation. But this is a classroom that's being built. Haiti. Awesome. We're doing that. My nonprofit, Rock of Roseville, doing this. Give me the next one. Building a house like that. That's not the actual house, but for a family, they, they're just starting it like last week. But that's what it will look like. Obviously, that's unfinished. And I don't know if there's another one. No other pictures. All right. So what are you talking about here? The question that wrecked me in a seminary class five years ago. As a Christian, do you have a right to a visionless life? I hated that question. Because they really wanted you to dial in 
and think about what, what you're doing, how you're living, and what God wants you to do. Man, they talked about this ugly word, goals. I hate that word. What are your goals? It's like, just be led by the Spirit. No, not good enough. Put numbers. It's like, no. You know why I didn't want to put numbers? Because when you put numbers, you got to be accountable. I don't want that. Get more comfortable with it. So, what's my vision? They, they asked, write a paper, big paper on vision, vision for your life. My life is to be lived as a resource to other countries that are poor, leaders that lack resources, to build houses for single moms, churches, classrooms, God willing hospitals, and to bring disaster relief where there's natural disaster. That's all I do. That's all I do. And let me tell you what. It took me till I was in my mid 60s to find that sweet spot. And you don't have to wait that long. You just ask God, how do you want me to give my life away? Because everybody has something. That's the deal. People say, well, I don't have this. I'm not gifted like him. I'm not, you know. The... No, no, no. It's a matter of resources. It's living life here. Stand up. So, so you think you're getting out of here. So you are. This is how the life is lived. Matthew 9, Jesus went to the villages and towns. History says 217 different villages and towns Jesus went to personally. When he saw the multitudes, they were scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And he was moved with compassion and he healed them. Wow. It takes, it takes going somewhere, seeing something that's not going on that should be going on or that is going on that shouldn't be going on, allowing your heart to be affected by it, and then stepping in in the power of the Holy Spirit and resource them. And so it's great. And the only reason I say this is because I'm, a, I'm a, just a, such an average guy, seriously. Average, 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 average guy that just happens to see some things in Scripture and see some things in the world and have a heart that gets kind of disturbed when I see stuff that shouldn't be. And that's the heart of God. And that's a great way to live, man. I tell you, I can't, uh, true confession, ask my wife if it's true. I can't wait to go to bed at night so I can get up the next day. I am that wound up because right now, right now things are happening. Churches are being built in other parts of the world right now. People are getting resourced. Once again, this just takes some eyes to see. I get asked to teach a class in a Bible college in Albania. What's the class? The kingdom of God. So I read what I think is one of the best books on the kingdom of God ever written. This book right here. I read that book. I was so moved. I called the, uh, emailed the author. I said, I want permission to print your book in a different language. He said, awesome, but you have to go through the publishing house. Call the publishing house. I want to print this book, Insurgents. Okay, it's going to cost you. All right. How much? $200 for the rights. <laughs> Done. 5000 later, $5,000. There's 100 of these books on the kingdom of God, translated in Albanian. I'm just saying, you see a need, you go, what? How, how do we get that? How do, does that happen? How much is it going to cost? And then you do it. And so right now, there is en enough for the next five classes that I'm going to teach. And they get that book free. Okay, let's pray. I don't know how we should pray. Sean, come on up here. It's called the pastor bailout. <laughs> but I do want to say something. Austin. When you have a calling and you finally step into it, there's a change. When I came in here, remember I came in here earlier? I came in here, nobody was here, these guys were rehearsing. Is that what they call it? Rehearsal? 
they were playing. I just sat there and worshiped. I didn't know it was him. I thought, man, who is this guy? This guy's good. This is good. I just worshiped there for a minute. And then you're up there, and I leaned over to Brandon. He said something like, man, I, got, I like him. I go, I like him. And I said, who is that? He goes, it's Austin. I said, that's Austin? <laughs> didn't even recognize you, bro. Seriously. Keep de- letting God develop that gift. That, yeah. Easy to worship too. Good job. One time the Holy Spirit whispered to me about five years ago. He said, you need to up your asking. He was challenging how small my prayers were. You got to up your ask. Seriously, man. Your prayer, your prayer life is in direct proportion to how you see God. Amen. If we could just transcribe all your prayers, what would we see? Little prayers must be a little God. Man. Once again, Jesus said these words that mess with us. All things are possible to those who... He said it. I didn't say that. He said it. Will you believe it? I had one little fear. <laughs> well, I got a lot of little fears. My wife's out of town too. And it's like I hear a noise in the night. I'm like... Usually I send her, check that out. No. I got backup. I'm serious. I got backup and squirt gun up here. But when I, when, I, when I felt like God said, I want you to build 100 churches in Nepal, man, I got really excited about it. I thought, That'd be the coolest thing. And then I thought, what if I got there and Jesus said, well done. Why didn't you believe for more? I don't know. I don't think he'd say that, but it's like, I just know we ask too little. Why don't you put your hands on the shoulder next? Unless they've had dermatological surgery. (laughs) Then massage it. (laughs) Lord, we pray your kingdom come and your will be done in every family in this church in every neighborhood that this family is a part of. In every nation that you've called us to go, we pray your kingdom come. We pray for an abundant supply of every resource for every good work. Reveal to us the good works, God, because that's what you provide for. Don't let us get led astray. Don't let us get preoccupied with things that aren't on your heart. Help people really get a revelation of what it means to live in the kingdom of God. And I pray right now, I just want to pray for one thing, the spirit of fear. How many of you wrestle with fear? I'm, I'm just going to pray a prayer right, right now. Yep. Father, in the name of Jesus, you've not given any of us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Sound mind. So we rebuke a spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. And we pray the peace of God that passes all understanding would come to every person in this room and guard their heart and their mind through Christ Jesus. We pray not our will be done, but your will be done in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So be it.